Now broadcasting live. Now live. <laughs> and Justin Breesler is the first one in. Awesome, Justin. And oh there, yes, I love we'll, it. We'll give it a few minutes here, a few seconds here, so everybody can uh, can log in, and then we'll uh, we'll get started because um, we have an extraordinary uh, uh, opportunity today to to kick off the e tourism summit uh, at twenty twenty one. It's uh, as is everything. Uh, e tourism summit is going to be very different uh, in twenty twenty one. This year we're uh, we're doing a hybrid model with twenty one days focused on uh, uh, twenty twenty one, and uh, I'm thrilled to uh, be able to kick off our event this year um, with uh, an amazing partner. Uh, my name is Will Stephan. I'm president of Connect Travel, and we're proud to. Uh, be the owners and managers of the E-Tourism Summit. This is our 24, 21st year of the E-Tourism Summit. Uh, and it's going to be an exciting an exciting ride. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank all the sponsors that have stepped up to make this happen this year uh, in a really extraordinary way. And probably nobody better um, doing that than uh, my good friend, Josh Collins, who speaks here. Josh, I'd like to thank you for sponsoring this event. and. Uh, Turn it over to you. Well, thanks. Well, Linda, uh, yeah, I hear a little bit of an echo too. I think uh, we might be able to fix that here in just a second. But uh, it is uh, it is so much fun to be here. It's a new platform, right? We we got so used to Zoom, and now all of a sudden we do have some uh, virtual events coming online, and and uh, we're we're being forced to yet again change behavior, get used to new platforms. Uh, so it's interesting. I'm sitting here clicking around, and, and and again, love seeing Justin's name at the top of the list. That's so fun. Paul, uh, Ryan, Kim, Denise, Paula, Lauren, all of you. So great to see uh, familiar names, and uh, it just brings a, you know brings some joy. Uh, to, to see your name, uh, tuning in, and then to recall just so many shared memories over the years of, of different events and, and previous e tourism Summit. So, Will, thanks for uh, the invitation. Thanks for the privilege of being here. And um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Collins. Uh, I am the Director of Destination Activation and Marketing for Street Sense. Street Sense is a global creative company that builds uh, brands people love and places people love to be. So uh, naturally, we just are a, a perfect good fit for those of you looking to recover uh, you know, from this, this COVID epidemic, pandemic, and, and recover strong and, and think about you know, more holistic strategies for your tire destination. And um, so uh, there is, I believe, and just a couple of housekeeping before uh, Sarah just wows her with uh, with her <laughs> telling you, you guys are in for such a treat. Uh, you may not know this, uh, but Sarah is also called the Duchess of Doom. So we are going to have some really good time uh, together and learning together and, and really thankful for the macro view of, uh, uh, that she's going to give us and certainly invite us into, uh, you know, reimagining and rethinking about travel much more holistically than we probably typically do. Um, so I'm, I'm excited, Sarah. Glad to see you and, and so glad you're here. Just a bit of housekeeping as we kick off here, you will see um, in this platform, big marker at the top, you'll see a place where you can chat. Obviously, feel free, uh, drop in your comments. You can ask questions. We're gonna uh, make sure we leave time at the end for a Q&A. So would love to, uh, you know, to, to facilitate that with, with you guys and, and Sarah. Um, and then of course, you've got a little bit of a, there's a, a little note there. Um, if you'd like to connect with me directly, you can click that note at the top and do so, but um, Sarah, why don't you uh, why don't you kick us off? We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, if we can launch the slides, we'll get ready to go here and uh, have a bit of fun. Um, as you can see, hold on, I got to see my slides. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, I, I you know we talked about the the title being initially you know it's a sprint, not a marathon. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, but I also wanted to add resilience and rebound, right? Because I think that if you really think about this, it, the strength that it takes right now to go through this because you cannot necessarily see 
the end of this, right? And, and those are the two things that sort of have to balance off as you're sprinting, but really understanding you've got to be sprinting for a lot longer than you ever have been before. Why do I say that? I think it's really critical to really recognize that what unfortunately this pandemic has done has actually accelerated trends that were already there, but literally accelerated things like 10 years and moved them right into your face, whether you were ready for them or not. And thus, you can't just even just sort of say, well, I'll get to that. You can't just get to that. You have to do it now. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are and where we're going. And some, I think some tips that can help you think about how you attack your business to really set it up, structure it strategically to profit from what's going on and what will be coming in the future. So with that, I'm going to jump in. So, ah, the beach. We remember this. Nice resort on the beach. Skiing. Skiing is coming up. I lived 10 years in Switzerland. Ski the Alps all the time. I understand that. And for those of you in the Northeast, it's leaf peeping season. So what do these slides all have in common? Other than like, I'd like to be there rather than here right now. Well, they represent the fact that the top holiday gift for the last three years has been a vacation. Think about that. Instead of the ugly Christmas sweater and let, instead of you know racing around for the latest electronic device or whatever, we wanted to spend time together. It's all about the connectedness and being together with those that we love and care about. So this is to understand this is the mindset of where we were going into this pandemic. Then we now, how do we recapture that? That's really what we've got to think about. Well, let's talk a little bit. And here's how I'm going to put the nerd hat on a little bit. Um, but I'm going to talk about where we are now. So you really can understand the dramatic shift of what has occurred. I mean, it, we all feel it in our lives. We're sick of our houses. I'm sick of myself. Um, so I understand all this. But the reality is let's look at where we are with respect to employment, consumer sentiment, retail sales, and ultimately the travel industry. Well, huh, unemployment rate. Wow, did that zoom up? Like that was like automatic, March, turn on the switch, everybody stopped, right? But look at the, you know, it's inching back, but be very clear. We are nowhere close to where we were for months and understand that we were at what we call in the economic world, full employment. Um, and ironically, you know, we actually were running out of workers because we all didn't have enough kids years ago. So in fact, we're short replacing all the baby boomers who are now retiring. So this is a really interesting sort of thing also created by the pandemic is these excess labor force is actually needed because we had run out of labor. Another way to look at this is to look at this in a little bit more pessimistic way, right? Which is to see that initial massive layers off in March you see the rehiring as we reopened up the economy in many ways, but notice that the additions are now slowing. I think this is very concerning, right? Um, because again, um, you can sort of see that the pattern was, yeah, we rebounded, but how far is there now a limit to the rebound for a period of time? Something we'll have to really watch, right? So let's look at consumer sentiment. This is the University of Michigan poll. Um, that they do. And as you can see, this is more concerning, right? Because this tells you, do I have the confidence that I'm getting another paycheck, that I'm going to have a job tomorrow, that I might get bonus so I can take a vacation, all those types of things. And what it's showing you is that that is nowhere near actually correlating with where um, employment is. Because if you delve into the employment statistics, for example, you see a lot of people working part-time who want to work full-time and those type of sort of challenges that we're still seeing. Um, so there really still hasn't been this real confidence that we're we're on the way back. And in all fairness, I've got to tell you, I believe not only um, until there's a vaccine, but also until there's wide adoption of the vaccine. And that means greater than 55 percent of people in the country have taken it. Um, well, I think that this will rebound back to this, those strong increasing levels that we were seeing. So this is one to be a bit concerned about. All right. Let's look at retail sales. For those of you that don't know, retail sales is 70% of the U.S. economy. So, you know, you can look at GDP, you can look at manufacturing. They talked about it in the debate. That doesn't matter. What really matters here more than anything 
is to understand that retail sales drives the economy. So you can see, we started spending strong, we continued, but now it's fallen off dramatically. And as you can see, say, as I say, sales have improved here since the lockdown, but what happened, all right? The, the, the growth was only 0.6% in August. It was expected to be 1%. What was the difference there? Well, it was the expiration of the federal unemployment benefits. If you don't think that that money was needed, you're absolutely incorrect. That was what was sustaining the absolute growth in the fundamental economy. Remember, 40% of Americans do not have even $400 saved for a rainy day. So this was the actual money that was helping keep this increased spending going on. The good news with restaurants opening, we did see food service increase 4.7% month over month. So that was a real positive. But note the bottom line here that the overall retail industry is employing almost 700,000 um, fewer people than it did a year ago. So some, some challenges there. All right. So let's move into the space we're all here to discuss, which is the travel landscape, right? So we'll start with spending, right? Because this is where you can, you know, the rubber meets the road, as they say. So that as of September 24th this year, this is late data, travel spending is down 45% year over year in the United States. Pretty stark number, right? So that's even including the summer travel season, everything, right? More importantly, post the Labor Day, when we headed back to school, et cetera, um, you know, we saw that it has dropped 5% consecutive weeks since the Labor Day holiday. And this is, frankly, 100% due to the absence of business and group travel spending, something I'm sure you've seen in your businesses, right? And this is the real challenge to really think about. Now, look, there is a realization that we now need to not hop on an airplane for every meeting, right? We know that we can successfully conclude and keep business going without necessarily doing that. Does that mean I would prefer in-person contact? Of course, every human does, all right, with the exception of a few hermits. But the rest of us actually want to be together in person. But it's just not going to happen. Also, because businesses now are critically looking at their budgets and saying, is this necessary travel? right? As opposed to nice to have travel, right? And this is, I think, going to even more impact conferences. I mean, I have felt even the last couple of years, we've gotten to too many conferences with all apologies, Will. Um, but I think that now we're going to really see how many things do we really have a positive effect. And this is going to get back to metric measurements, which is something you've really got to add into your business met, uh, metrics so that people really feel the need to do something, right? And you can actually quantitatively justify it. Notice that, you know, some states have had it worse than others. Nine states have reported losses greater than 50%. I think you can guess who some of those would be. And look at that massive cumulative loss of $383 billion, right? Just a huge number. But this is another sort of secondary effect that I think is extremely important to really recognize. How much can the government help us here, right? Now, look, I'm a capitalist from the University of Chicago, but I'm also someone with a very soft side. I grew up in Massachusetts, so you can balance those two, right? But thinking about the fact that 49.6 billion less in taxes has been collected is critical. Understand, this is not just gas taxes. This is airline taxes, all right? That this is, which obviously pays for infrastructure, but it pays for so much more in the general budget. In a state like Florida, which does not have an income tax, resort taxes pay for a significant amount of the services for the state. This is something that is going to be continuing that. This is why there is an incentive from everybody to try to get tourism going again, because this is so critical. So it's not that we aren't hand in hand trying to work together to make this work. We've got to figure out how to do it safely, but this is critical to the lifelines of the state and local governments. Looking at road travel here, all right? So this is the arrivalist index, all right? And what's interesting about this index is these are trips over 50 miles, right? So this isn't, you know, trips that are just short, like your daily commute. This is looking at where I've taken a road trip, right? But again, look at the real dramatic slowdown past post Labor Day. And this was really what happened. People took their vacations driving because they didn't want to get on a plane, right? We knew the fear of that. We could see that in the airline travel numbers and the like, which has obviously been the case. Um, but the interesting thing is the slowdown has also coincided with, unfortunately, a reignation of cases 
across the country in certain hotspots, right? And that's going to put a kibosh on a lot of people wanting um, to drive and travel and again. And this is a real challenge that, again, we're going to be facing, you know, because you can't find a cure for this thing. We can find amelioration for it, but we're waiting for that vaccine, right? So let's look at air travel. In this case, I pulled the TSA numbers, right? Now, obviously today, sadly, is D-Day, and we know that 32,000 people within the industry have lost their jobs in the airline industry. Um, but look at it. There's still 69% fewer passengers going through TSA. If you um, take a flyover over the desert anywhere, you will see tr planes parked anywhere. My husband happens to be a rocket scientist who um, also designs jet engines and, and like. Um, there is no demand. No planes are being sold at the moment. Right. So this is a huge understanding that this industry expects to be slow for at least another three to four years. And again, the lack of business travelers, which has been the lifeline of the airline industry, is very important. Now, I want to say a couple of comments here that I think are very important. I tweeted it out earlier today. There is not a lot of sympathy in Congress to help the airlines. They did an initial 25 billion, yes, but the reality is there is a real divided thought that these are publicly traded companies who can go to the capital markets because the stock market is very strong right now. The bond market is working just functioning fine with interest rates at almost zero, that these companies can borrow money. You know, we understand that American Airlines is very indebted, but the others can absolutely borrow money. So the issue that the taxpayer should actually fund this versus them going to the capital markets. Um, again, same thing could be said for Disney, who laid off 28,000 people. They can all go to the capital markets to keep a lifeline and keep alive here. That is a critical difference between small businesses and the big businesses. So I think you have to look at that very carefully. So I'm not expecting a bailout here for them anytime soon. It may come through but they're working hard on it, but I don't think so. But I'm gonna put the Duchess of Doom hat aside for a few minutes just to look at travel bookings. This is a forward looking indicator, right? So it's critical to, to actually see the positive. Notice the divergence though between the international bookings and the domestic bookings, right? So this data came from Adara and you can actually see that it is proved. It's still below 50%, it's minus 54% year over year, right? But there is an improvement here. And this is saying that people are starting to feel confident. And I think this is a testament for positive, for example, that the airlines have done, a, I think, a very good job messaging how much safer, you know, with all the things they've done in terms of the air circulation, the filters, the you know, many of them, not, not all the airlines, but many of them, you know, keeping a middle seat empty, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's been a real positive. Obviously, states that are a little more remote have benefited more. Montana, Wyoming, they're only down about 7%. So this is a, a positive. But look at New York, down 74%. Uh, Massachusetts, obviously New York being a massive business destination and a tourism, international tourism destination. Um, Boston, which is really surprising when you think about it, but they also were the centers of heavy, unfortunate COVID losses early or in, the, in March. And I think this has also continued to, to you know, sort of carry on. Look at the international bookings. That is also very critical because that, that's been a huge impact on the positive things for the travel industry over the past five years here. And, you know, there's many countries that just won't allow travel to the United States. All right. And, or again, will people come, right? And especially if they have to quarantine upon arrival, right? Well, not everybody has three to four to weeks to spend as a Opposed to two weeks, if you have to quarantine, for example, in New York for two weeks, you're not necessarily having a great vacation. So let's talk a little bit about small business. And I think this is very important. A lot of people don't recognize, and this is for economics data, that 83% of the travel industry is represented by small and medium-sized businesses. And in fact, in their employees, 95% of, of all you know, hotel accommodation and food service employment is in small and medium-sized businesses. So while the, the large companies get the headlines, understand that this is where critically we need to help this industry, right? Because this is the small business that is providing the jobs, that is providing sort of the engine of the industry, right? And let's not forget those in the arts, the entertainments, the recreation sectors, which is another 82% of people employed, right? Small businesses. So uh, sadly, these are also supposed to be the ones that will actually recover the slowest due to the pandemic, right? All right. So you've heard all the sort of the, the negative challenges and such here. Let, let's talk a little bit about what's next. And again, I want to go back to this marathon versus a sprint. Business is always a marathon because you want to be around 
or 25 years from now, right? So you, you want the legacy of your business, right? That's the positive. And that's why you do it. You want to see it get better, continue, evolve and such. And that's the great things. But the thing that we're not usually used to is having to pivot immediately. And what I want you to do is get a little uncomfortable here and say, it's okay, even though my team worked on a forecast for a year and my accounting team worked with all my strategic team and, and me as CEO figured this out, we're gonna do this, um, we're all good and I'm good with that, we're gonna go with this plan. I want you to say it's okay any day to tear up things and start another way and try something new because you don't have a choice. And that's the bottom line. The consumer now knows that he or she is in charge. And by the way, it is she because 78% of spending done by, by women. Um, and, you know, I always like to really remind my husband that, you know, we actually make the other 28% as well. So, but that being said, I think that it's really important to really recognize that there are things we can do. So I want you to think about that in the past when we've been marketing travel and thinking about it, we've been thinking it around actual events, Thanksgiving with the family, a honeymoon, a fa family gathering. And, and it's also been about the experience, which is very, very important. But the experience has changed. And I think you have to accept that we're not going back to where we were anytime soon. We're not going to be having massive gatherings and thousands of people and concerts and things like that. And, you know, I think one of the great adaptations has been how we've gone back to using drive-ins for live concerts and for films and events and things like that, right? There's a great example of pivoting really quickly to still be able to share something, but knowing that we can't do it in the typical way. And I think that's very important. But I want you to think about that marketing now has to be much more precise and much more to me as an individual. So you have to take the budget and the time and learn the metrics about me that is going to make me respond to your offers, right? And this is really important for both your existing clients, you have to love them and pull them even closer, and your new ones that you're hoping to acquire, right? Because the thing that we recognized and learned, and this is really the fundamental shift of what the pandemic, and I think it's a positive thing, if there's any one positive thing that could come out of this, is that we have decided that our families and our friends are the most important things in our lives. It's not our jobs. It's not our businesses. It's not anything else. Like, it is all about the family, and it is all about your friends. And, and so, therefore, you have to understand that the, there's emotions created by that inter, inter, introspection. So you have to think about how can I respond to that, right? You have to think about the word value. What do people value? And how do I actually figure out that? We value people. That's what we value. So we don't value stuff. We're not as materialistic as we were. We can see that. Now you've seen what's been happening. Where's been the biggest emphasis of spending thus far in the pandemic? Home improvement. Not just because we're stuck at home with, you know, the 1.3 kids we had in the dog. It's really that we actually looked around and said, you know, this is fun. Let's do a project together. We're spending, we're doing, we're accomplishing something together. That's been the real, the real impact of what we've actually seen, right? So we're valuing these relationships we have with people. And we also have recognized that what we thought was permanent isn't, but family and friends are, right? So jobs weren't permanent. We lost those. Security. And sadly, we lost people, right? So the issue is, is understanding that if you can pivot and then say, well, how do I tie in and make my my offering, whether it's my hotel, my restaurant, my hotel, you know, my, my airline experience, how are we tying in so we become part of that and celebrating these relationships and the importance of this, I think it's going to be extremely important. So what are some of the action items? Well, you've got to reset your expectations, right? You've really got to say, what are the wins we're going to have here? How, how are we going to really measure ourselves, right? Um, and then you have to really segment your clients. I mentioned that, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of people in this country who haven't been as fortunate, for example, to work from home, who don't have savings. Remember, only 50% of Americans have money in the stock market. Right. So just because the stock market's reaching new highs doesn't mean that that's at all contributing to the wealth of over half the population of America. Right. 
So segmenting people to really understand who am I talking to? That doesn't mean that that family um, of lesser income doesn't still want to take a holiday with their family or spend time or to have a special experience with them. You just have to reach out and understand the segmentation. So this involves the pricing of your product. And I want you to be thinking about like, what should we, you know, how, how many levels should we have in pricing? And really, do I have a price right for the real experience that it is? Not what I think the value is. Remember, it's all about the client and what they think the value is and how does it relate to, you know, bonding tighter in their relationships and with the people that they love and care about. And then if you know what people actually value, then you can actually market to them, potentially making an aspirational purchase. You know, one of the things I, I said to people is, you know, how about creating a, a, a calculator on your website that allows people to personally sort of save for that valuable vacation? I remember once I was down in Brazil and I was talking with someone who worked security at our office down there. And he said that he had been saving for a year to take his family to Disney World. And that was the big thing. And he looked each month and he measured it and it got the whole family involved thinking about it because it obviously it was a very expensive trip for him. That's the point to understand. Well, how can we help people actually save for these things? Think about it. Make it an aspirational, something they look forward to as a family to do. Um, you know, obviously with your, you know, higher priced um, price point products um, and reaching out that more affluent people then understand what makes that experience very unique to them and really understanding what what really is going to be that hook that they feel like they need to be involved with, right? So how do you do this? Well, digital connection, all right? And, and you know, a lot of people have found out during this pandemic that they under invested in their technology. And that's not the technology for all of us to zoom each other and work from home. That has nothing to do with it. It's really understanding like we didn't really upgrade our digital marketing. We didn't upgrade our segmentation of our clients. We don't know how to contact them in the way that they wish to be contacted with the frequency that they wish to be contacted. Email's not enough. I, I, I probably delete 8 trillion of them a day, it feels like, right? So this is where an investment in analytics, but analytics that are actionable is what you need to invest in. Not those just to say, I can pull up a whole spreadsheet every morning and say this, you know, and, and point that these are what we know. It's what can we actually do with that data that makes it functional, right? And measuring this return on investment of your advertising spending. The, it is not good enough anymore just to spend to raise brand awareness. We don't care. What we've really proven, as you can see, is brands have not been the driving force in the, in the pandemic. What has been is something in the usefulness of how we've actually achieved the experience with a given product. Very important distinction there. And then really look at the quality of this. Now, come on. All of us now know that, you know, whatever you use for a phone, whether it's an Android or an Apple, all right, that we know that the quality of these phones has gotten incredible. So you can do everything almost off of a phone as opposed to, you know, buying all technical equipment. But don't underspend on the quality of this because people really need, they're not going to physically go and touch things. That's the difference. So understanding how you convey the uniqueness of, of your offering and your experience and the quality of what you're doing is really critical. And that includes a lot of video that's streaming, right? It was very important for people to do. And again, as I mentioned, creating a tool for people to measure their aspirational goals, I think is a great way to really involve. All right. And connect, you know, build and tighten the relationship with your clients, really make certain that there's interactive feedback coming your way. You know, one of the things that, that I think is great about, for example, my relationship with American Airlines is I can tweet at them from the air and they'll tweet back, right? And they know who I am, right? And that's the big difference that they've taken that time to square the circle there, right? And those are the types of things that I think is very, very important is to understand how do I want to be communicated with? Tighten that relationship. What's important to me? What am I thinking about right now? You know, be that partner to them. So you're partnering and creating an experience. If they're taking this trip with you, they're visiting your experience that you're offering. How are you actually thinking about that? And then one thing that's very important is, and this is exceptionally important with um, the millennials on down to Gen Z. All right, is show the love of the community that you're within. 
this and this is not just write a check once a year to you know your favorite you know charity that is not it's really being involved and investing in the community that you're in so that people know that and and it's really important and we can actually see that people will prefer and patronize brands that are tied in with their love of the community especially the ones that they live in especially if we're going to be tightening the circle for the short term at least um, in terms of where we're traveling so as you invest in that community you will see that and you see the stat that i put there that 87 percent of americans believe saving small business is critical to their community right so what is the small business doing for the community? Make it that two-way street and make it very visible. It's an important thing to really understand. The other thing I want you to think about is how you reward your employees, all right? And I think for those of you who are business owners, this is really critical. Um, you got to stop thinking about them as employees. I started on Wall Street when Wall Street was all private partnerships. None of the companies were publicly traded. And we all felt that we were part of that family and, and we aspire to be part of that partnership. And so there was that real sense of commitment. And it was very rare that someone jumped from one co company to another company. Um, use that capital you have, and I don't mean capital in terms of money, capital in terms of human capital, to really understand because what work environment are you creating? How are you thinking about how you're working with your teams to really make certain there's real sensitivity so people feel that commitment to you as you feel to them? And then demonstrate through passion. I think that's so important because, you know, we, I, I think being passionate about, you know, I'm passionate about making certain that, you know, everybody gets a good education. Everybody has a healthy meal at night. And, and I use my knowledge of economics and my, my work on, on Wall Street to actually try to bring and share this, right? That's my passion, right? Everyone has a passion. Make it, in, it you know, it's shared with other people because it's very infectious. People will get on that wagon with you and want to be part of people that really care and have that investment in what they're doing. And I think it's, it's extremely important and valuable to, to what you're trying to do. Now, this is going to take time. More than 40% of the population say they won't take a vacation until there's a vaccine. Mordana came out today and said they're not having a vaccine until 2021 at best, right? And they were one of the early trials that, that everybody thought was going to be here, right? Now, um, my brother-in-law is involved with the production of the vaccines, and his statistics and his company basically are saying they don't think it's before, you know, next summer at the best, right? That we really start to get most, you know, most of the people that we need to, you know, vaccinate, right? So these, we have to realize that we can't force this issue, but what we can do is take small wins in all of this, right? Um, you can see a typo there. It should, it should say it will take time for many people to have additional savings, all right? Um, to take a vacation again. So again, this is one where I, I need you to have compassion and understanding and realize the economic impact and devastation that the pandemic has, has had. And while your business may have suffered greatly, everybody has suffered greatly. And not to mention those families of the 208,000 people who've been lost sadly in this country, right? So understand that we're gonna to have to have some time to help people build back. So thinking about what can I really charge for this? It's not about making the ultimate profit right now, it's about survival, right? And then it's about profitability. And I think that's very important. It's also important that you use all of the resources that you have to prolong your business right now. It, it, it is not gonna be easy. And I, and I would you know be lying to you if I said otherwise, but really thinking about um, it's not about the percentage, for example, of ownership you have in your company. It's about having enough capital to keep sustaining it. I always remind everybody that, um, you know, having 1% of a company worth a billion is more than having 100% of zero. So if you're diluting yourself to keep it going, it's okay. Because the more important thing is, how do you think about growing? Uh, and, and I think this is extremely important. Um, you know, one of the things I always, uh, fun story is um, when Jay Walker was founding Priceline and running Priceline before it was huge and big, he somehow wrangled that meeting with William Shatner. And he was able to convince Shatner to take stock, all right, rather than payment, because he couldn't pay him any cash. 
Now, that was actually the most money that Chapman's actually made in his career, more than any of his TV stuff, because of where Priceline stock went, right? So understanding that the dilution didn't matter to Priceline, it was the survival of how do we raise the awareness and where we're going. So thinking about how you do that with your business, I think is an extremely important thing right now. And then remember that this is really a great time for you to strategically look at your business and really say, are we going the right direction? Are we thinking about this correctly? Is this where everyone's going to be? So, you know, as many of you who may have heard me before, I've talked about my skepticism about e-commerce, right? And, and, and I still believe, even with everything that's gone on in the pandemic, that it'll still never be more than 30% um, of, of the uh, economy in terms of retail sales. I truly believe that. And remember, before all this started, with all the hype that we heard, including Amazon sales, it was still only 11% of, of retail sales, right? So remember, most people in this country prefer to go physically to the store and touch the goods and have that experience, right? But we know that having that communication tool through e-commerce, whether you fulfill it physically in the store, when people actually get to come in, you know, that's what the key thing. So if you think about a company like Best Buy, they spun their business, which was in big trouble, very close to bankruptcy, right? By turning their, their showrooms into experience centers. And most people actually order and get a large TV delivered to the house. Who wants to carry a 75 inch TV home, right? So understand that, that that's how you can think about it. So make certain that you're thinking about strategically, how do I move my business right now? How do I right size it? How do I think about what's what's important right now? What's, what's going forward? What I can execute on today? What is something we're going to do the minute we see X, Y, Z statistic turn to the positive? Those are the ways I think you can think about this, right? But the most important is you got to embrace it. This is the new normal. We aren't going back to where we're all going to get on a cruise ship, where we're all going to, you know, pack a huge football stadium. It's just not going to happen for a long time period of time, right? And, and so the issue becomes, how do we then think about really that hybrid experience? Think about if you could like, like everyone loves the Super Bowl, right? Well, most everyone, I love the Super Bowl, right? And, under, and it's even better when my New England Patriots Center, but if they're not, I still love the Super Bowl. But thinking about how you can turn your restaurant into a great party, socially distanced enough, but everybody still has the community experience of watching a great team event like that. That's an example of how you can, in a hybrid world, you know, make an excitement around an event, right? And this is what we're going to have to think about. This is the new normal and we just have to embrace it, right? So that's really what I wanted to share with you today. I've left a lot of time for questions because I think it's important to really have a dialogue about this challenge, you know, what I'm thinking about here. Um, and we can actually really discuss it further. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. I love it. Wow. So great. Um, oh, let's be sure to post uh, Sarah's contact info too for everybody. That that was really quick. I meant to uh, grab that and actually post that myself too, just for us all. But uh, maybe uh, we'll, or there we go. Perfect. You guys, you guys write that down and feel free to, uh, to email her, you know, I Thanks mean, uh, that, that is so helpful. What uh, I'm like, there's a few questions I've got in my head. And for those of you tuning in, obviously, um, thank you again. Uh, at the top on the right hand side, you should see where it says chat, Q&A, polls, handouts, etc. Feel free to, to drop in any questions. But Sarah, you were talking about, um, you know, your outlook, obviously. Does that outlook vary according to your, you know, the way you see things? Does that vary by category at all? Or do you see it like, you know, obviously between airlines, hotels, restaurants, attractions, etc.? Well, look, clearly, I think airlines are going to have the hardest time, right? Because it, the fixed cost of running an airline means the seat can only get so cheap, right? And, and that's really the problem, right? It's, it's expensive to put that bird in the air. And, and, and so I think that that's going to be the challenge. Um, so I think that industry and, and, and I think, and remember, I stayed importantly focused um, here because frankly, we're not going to be allowed into a lot of countries for a heck of a long period of time because of our, our, our COVID incidents, right? So just understand that. So, so I, I've kept it domestic here. Um, however, 
I think that from the hotel perspective, I think that can recover significantly faster. And I think that, to be perfectly honest, I think the hotel industry is really lagged um, here in terms of what they've done. They've been extremely silent. There's been very few ads other than to say we're open again, but not ads saying, you know, we have this industrial cleaning force. Think about it. A regular hotel system, Hilton, any of the major chains, they've all got, you know, maids who are in the rooms every single day. They've put in new protocols. But have you seen them once advertise that we've done new protocols? Airbnb has done a significantly better job of actually a checklist that actually uh, uh, approves a house that, you know, it, it has made the cleaning list and it has reached our standards to make this thing. Like that's what the, the, the hotel industry, I feel, has been very, very short sighted and not thinking about um, those types of things. Because again, if you feel comfortable doing something, you'll share it with your, your network, your friends and family. Hey, we went here. It was great. It was really clean. You know, I, they assured me that the room hadn't been used, you know, for a week or rotate, they're rotating rooms around those types of things, right? Because no hotel is full right now, right? So they can advertise we, we're, we're not putting, you know, using the same room two days in a row. We're, you know, fumigating it. We've changed the filters in our systems. All these types of things that we now have learned are critical here. Our staff wears masks at all times and over the nose um, and things like that. You know, like that's an interesting one that you can think about. Now, in terms of attractions, the real challenge we've got here is we've got, you know, obviously local regulations and understanding crowd size. I think one of the biggest things the industry needs to do is be better at self-policing themselves. Every time there's a picture of a bar with people packed, you know, you know, tons of time. Remember the, the Ozarks in, in Memorial Day with everybody in the pool right next to each other, just horrific scene. And by the way, ended up with a ton of COVID, right? Um, those, that, all that stuff works against us. So I think we've got to actually be our own advocates here. And, and help police, um, you know, look, we, you know, um, my husband works up in New York and literally every single day, the, you know, Governor Cuomo comes out, we've shut another 17 bars and restaurants now. Like this is not helpful, right? So everybody's gotta be better, all right? As, as unpleasant as it is, but if we as a, together as a society say, this is the level where we gotta be right now, this is how we stay open and, and move forward, then I think that that would be a better thing. So obviously not to hold you to this, but I'm just curious because you do have such a great eye on the data from what you're seeing on airlines. Any any rough guess on when they might get back to some sort of, you know, better, uh, whatever better might be? 2024. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It'll take that long to, I think, to recover. Um, it's just, a, it's a confident and it's also a financial issue. So there's a question I've noticed here. So, you know, what's the other parts of the world doing? Well, it's very interesting. Um, they're about to shut their other parts of the world down again. All right. And so what's really been interesting as they've reopened borders, for example, in Europe, it started traveling across the borders. It doesn't, you know, a, a virus doesn't respect a border. And, and this has been the challenge. Now, look, Government assistance is extremely important. If I would say that the one thing all of us should do, I don't care what your political party um, affiliation is here, is we need another, and, and you can change an income level if you want to, we need more help with the um, a, a package coming through that says that, that there's going to be more unemployment assistance, um, you know, for those who are still um, long-term unemployed um, and for those making below a certain amount of money. There just has to be more assistance here because there's not enough going on here. I think that's very, very important. And that's the difference you see in other countries. Let's be clear. I, I'm on the board in um, Raleigh, North Carolina of the Wake Ed Partnership, which is the, the business community support of the public schools. We literally are paying $12 million between now and the end of the year to actually provide a place for kids to go to school at the Boys and Girls Club and at the YMCA while their parents have to go to work. And these kids can't afford to pay anything. The parents can't afford to pay anything for this. So we're sub subsidizing this. The rest of the world has childcare. Like this is the big difference between us and the rest of the world. This is a big challenge to really understand. We don't subsidize or have any sort of that. I lived in Switzerland for 10 years. You had crushes everywhere, right? So it's easy for a, a family to drop their children off to, you know, to a crush and go to work. These are some of the challenges we face here in, in the country. Um, the interesting thing that you're just watching in travel is it's very slow to pick up everywhere, right? Um, there was a summer travel season in, you know, Spain saw a pickup, Greece saw a pickup, but 
actually been an increase now, unfortunately, um, in, in, you know, uh, incidents of, of the virus, uh, you know, so we're seeing some challenges here um, because of this. So these are going to be the things that we're going to have to watch extremely carefully um, to understand. But when I look at the data of the other countries, they're a little bit better. But in fact, you know, we're seeing, you know, it pick up in Asia again, right? So these are the challenges where you you see you start to see a little bit of movement here and there. Um, but the reality is, is um, we you won't see significant travel until middle of next year, um, because that's when the whole world um, will start to get into, at the, at, at the more developed countries, I'll start with that, um, will start to have about 50% um, adoption of the vaccine. And, and then you can start to see people feel much more safer to travel around. So you, uh, it, it's a, you made me think about this because we did, there was, you know, of course, across the summer, uh, Will and myself and several others, we, we, uh, we're doing these weekly webinars. We were really hosting these conversations and many, many tuning in today were a part of those at various times throughout the summer. And, uh, and there was kind of an ebb and flow that we saw, right? Uh, some, some enthusiasm, some comfort, some confidence even, right? In, in various parts of the summer. Uh, people take advantage of their their you know newfound availability maybe or whatever it is. There became some confidence shifts, but now it does seem like we are shifting into another season or another emotional state. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I, you mentioned survival mode, and I think that is a very apt way to to describe this. So, what when when can we reasonably expect to no longer feel? Like we are going, continuing to be in survival. I know it's a hard question to ask, but what it's a really hard question. And and but the reality is, is is when we start to consistently see small businesses actually have a steady income, right? Because that's what we saw prior to the pandemic. It was small business, the small bookstore could survive. The small, you know, the small cafe was doing really well. You know, all the, that sort of sense, the community, even, even like you look at just the music community and, you know, you could, you could literally have music in every place and people were there and they were, you know, paying for it. And there was real creativity coming in the arts. Right. And, and so from that perspective, we need to start to see, you know, this country, you know, 70% of employment, in the entire country is in small and medium sized businesses. We need that confidence to go there. Unfortunately, we know that the PPP program was not hugely successful for those businesses. Some of them got it, but you really had to have a relationship with an existing bank, which many small businesses don't. And this is a real challenge and it was a real flaw in the program. I, I know that they, as they tinkered with it, it did get in and improved, which is good but uh, not enough of the, the capital. But the other thing is that um, one thing we all can do right now is we can actually push on our local officials because the states actually still have a ton of CARES Act money, all right, that they are not spending, right? And um, we found this out when we were finally able to get some of it for Wake County for, for this uh, program I was just sh sharing, right? I think we need to make certain that this is not the time to be savings. And let me be clear. Let me talk about the deficit for two seconds. If everybody always worries about that. All right. We have never had interest rates so low. We should be borrowing our everything we can from the kitchen sink. You're never going to see interest rates this low again in your life. You should be borrowing to the hilts and paying off your old debt and borrowing to the hilts because literally it's basically free. And this is the bottom line to really understand. Same thing for the U.S. government. Right. And this is this is the issue. That's why it's not an issue. That's why the, the market doesn't care. Right. Because we know we can pay our debt. No problem. And 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 so that's that's, I think, the thing to really appreciate here is that we need to be in spending mode. The Federal Reserve has done all their job. The government needs to now do their job to keep things going. And that breeds confidence because then we feel like, okay, we can go. Because look at where you saw the spending. People, as I said, were spending on their homes. And this was at all income levels. It wasn't just the wealthiest of people on their second home or third home. That wasn't what was going on. This was everybody, you know, you know, doing that little, let me just, you know, upgrade the porch a little bit or, you know, put some curtains up or whatever. And so you saw this little bits here and there, right? And I think this is the way to think about it. Now, the travel industry needs to think about 
How, how about holding virtual travel events for people in their homes? So everybody pretends they're at the beach or everyone pretends they're skiing and, and let's have a campfire and light your fires up and we're all there having a hot toddy around. Like start to bring that experience to us virtually. So then we actually are like, we're going there in, in February of 2021, right? Yeah. And start to think about those type of things. That's so great. Uh, and, you know, one of the big things we did was it, it produced the, this, this pandemic has produced the necessity to connect more and better with our locals. So you bringing up, you know, that trigger, or at least keeping the eye on small businesses, uh, small shops, et cetera, as being a signal. Uh, that is, I, I love that you highlight that because that's really good. That's one way that we can continue to shepherd and steward our destinations, you know, and, and our, our, all of our locations that are full. These these small businesses that you talk about. But when's the last time, for example, a big business within you know in the travel sector brought in all the small businesses and put them on their website and said, like, have you redone your website to sit there and say this is really the local community? Like one of the things that everybody always says is we we don't have enough time, right? Time's the number one thing nobody ever has enough time, on, right? But why aren't we making it easier for people to know um, how what to do? Right. And not just what partners who pay you, but really sit there and be the service to your clients to say, these are the five unique things you've never heard about to do when you come and visit us and either stay at our hotel or, you know, come to this town or whatever. And understanding that that and and, and rotate it every month. Like a, a website is not meant to be static. A, me, a website is meant to be constantly updated, constant content coming in there. Right. Are you spending the time right now while you're stuck at home um, to actually really play with that content and then throw it out there to people, your friends and say, does this sing to you? Is there really anything valuable you pulled off this that you didn't know? And you're my best friend, right? And that's the type of thing that we have the time to do right now that we don't usually have the time to do, but that's the things we have to be doing to really say, you know, um, you know, how do we do that? Like I, I'll be honest, I can't, you know, between the large hotel companies, I have to string this well between their brands. Like this is an opportunity right now in the midst of this for them to distinguish their brands. But how about the unique hotels that are in each town? How do you really distinguish your unique brand? What is really special about what you're thinking about and where, you know, and what, what I'm going to do there? Whether it's like you have a, a, a cool library for kids that I can, you know, have kids books. Heck, adults like to read kids books, by the way, right? Oh, shelf. I got a whole shelf down here. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like we love them, right? The places you go. Um, so like thinking about those types of things are the things that I'm saying we have the time now to make certain and connect, right? And 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 look, I can pull the stats for any country in the world. It's not going to be a big difference right now, right? Because unfortunately, this really is a global problem. The one thing that I will say is that the, the more you shut down harder at first, the better you're doing right now. That's just a, the mm. clear, so clear thing. We've got just a few minutes left, and, and we've got a great question. I, I, I Forgive me, I may mispronounce this, Daquan, I'm assuming that that might be how it is, but it's a great question. As someone who's new in the tourism industry, would you consider it an advantage or a disadvantage getting into this industry in the middle of COVID? Oh, my God, uh, it's an absolute advantage. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, literally, I think about, you know, you know, look, I lived through a, a lot of bad Wall Street days, right? Right. So, you know, and 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 the key was not that you could live through the, you know, the, you know, the trading debacle. It was how'd you come out the other side, right? And 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 those type of things. So I think that the key thing here is to understand, but what do I uniquely bring to the travel industry that it doesn't have right now? You know, can I add better content? Can I add, you know, more efficiency to a process? Can I make it easier for people to check in and check out? You know, can I, you know, think about how we reach a whole new cohort of people? Those like, so in other words, it's great if you're coming in, but if you're going to add a differentiating factor that is permanent, that can add, be additive to the business. Yes. Um, because look, when you come into something that's, you know, a disaster, that's nobody's fault, you know, you can come in and look like the hero. So I think it's a great time. Great question. Yeah, I, I completely agree too. It's the, you know, that, that new perspective is so needed too, right? If, if you're new to the industry right now, 
you are bringing in perspective that the rest of us that are have been around it, we may have said the same things, heard the same things for many years, we need, right? We need your voice. So uh, I would completely agree and encourage you uh, to to step up, keep sharing, keep, keep talking. Um, Sarah, one last question, because you, you touched on something earlier about um, our, our, you know, work environments. And then later you, you had this, the digital connection, which is totally my love language, by the way. I'm, I'm uh, all in on digital connection and, and, and human flourishing and all that. But I've long since seen a, con, you know, a, a, a synergy, if you will, between the connection we experience in our work environments and how we actually then market and communicate that out to the public, right? There are certainly a synergy there. So uh, how would you, uh, what tips or anything that you would give us, um, you know, around our work environments and, and things that we can look for, talk about, maybe, maybe invite conversations around? How would you lead us there? Well, I think it's extremely important to really understand what do you stand for? Like, why are you doing this business? You know, and and it, and if it's just to make money, that's okay. You can that can be a goal, right? But um, and then everybody knows it, and we know who that focus is around. But but there there has to be, and it's not just to say we have a great diverse culture and everybody loves being together because that's just crap. Right? Nobody believes that, and that's not reality, right? What is reality is to sit there and say we. You know, when I was the chief economist at MasterCard, the key thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to get everybody financially included around the world. And the goal was literally an additional 500 million people to be financially included in the world because we knew that that took them out of poverty. That's the entire goal of the company. Now, does the company make money every single day doing, you know, transactions and coming up with technology that enables? Of course it does. But the real Fun function of those products was to reach an additional people in that level and then get them on that road to economic inclusion, right? So that was the passion that kept me there. That was what I really was focused on, right? And, and I think, but we were able to convey that message outside the company and that was a big thing. So I think this idea of, and, and you know, Lori Joe Miller Farr wrote like, how are we someplace special, right? It's a great way to think about it. But that's what you have to also express in your culture, right? And understand like we are special because we have gone out to, to bring people in that we didn't even know we needed in this company, that we've decided that we're going to fix problems that we don't even know we have. And we're trying to think about how we, but, but more importantly, what has been clear over the course of the pandemic is that, look, we have a world that is unequal right now. And, and there are people that did, could come through this and there are people who did not through no fault of their own. And the reality is, is it, it is it, 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 very important to think that say, how do we reflect a better society that we want to be part of? And that I think the more companies can do that, right? And actually say, we're part of society. And it's not about doing good every day and volunteering at this event. It's literally saying, what are we doing to make certain we're paying enough in salaries? I mean, I'll call Amazon out all day long that they didn't pay enough for people that had to be on the front lines every single day delivering the packages to all of our homes, right? And I think that this is a big issue that we shouldn't be sitting there and thinking about you know, what's a living wage here? You know, that should not be an issue. And we should have companies that should be making enough. We're the only country in the world whose CEOs make 256 times the average employee of the companies, right? So think about that, right? So, and that's fine. I'm not saying, I, I said I'm a capitalist. I want to make money and I have made money in my life. But the issue is, is what's the right amount? And how do we think about this? These are the things that if we're reflecting this in our businesses, it makes people want to be part with us and ride that journey. And they're willing to financially support that. I'm willing to go to that hotel. I'm willing to visit that city that's making an effort to think and discuss that hard issue, right? Those are the types of things. And it's not about being a liberal socialist. It's literally sitting there and saying, I want to reflect society and how are we doing that in our business, right? And I think that's very important. And that, by the way, also leads into the fact that we need to have our businesses in the travel industry reflect our communities. And that means the makeup of, of every type of people and, and in our in our businesses, because again, that's also extremely important to people. Wow, I, I, can't, I can't agree more. That's fantastic. Uh, what a gift. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for being with us today and, uh, you know, helping us think differently and look a little bit bigger, you know, broaden our, our views a little bit here with, uh, with the outlook. And uh, again, thank you everyone for tuning in. 
Uh, be sure to check out the website for uh, what's next. And it's going to be a great month of sessions and really excited to, to see you all here again. Thank you. It's it's no small thing to give your time and, and join us and participate with us. So, and it's Sarah, I hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, we will, we'll see you next, we'll see you again somewhere. I'm sure. I'm sure we will hopefully actually in person. That's right. That's right. Right. All right, everybody take care. Have a Thank great day. You.